Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this uh, hearing today. Thank you, Representative Donalds, for hosting as well. I appreciate all the witnesses here uh, for this panel and the next panel as well. And I appreciate the community for hosting and the law enforcement who are here. And uh, I, I have a few things, uh, but I, I am going to come back to the bone that Mr. Donalds has kindly set out for me to chew some meat off of. But uh, before I get there, I want to just go through some other stuff as well. Uh, FEMA, Small Business Administration, the Department of Housing and Urban Development are among the more than 30 federal agencies that Congress has tasked with programs fo focused on disaster relief and recovery efforts. It's no secret that the patchwork of programs can be a nightmare to disaster survivors and communities to navigate. But Congress' ad hoc approach to providing support for these programs contributes to delays in the deployment of resources to be that to impacted communities. I, I think, and I think what Mr. Donalds is getting at and what I want to make as the theme is, is Congress is as much responsible for any, any flaws in disaster relief as, as any agency, for sure. And, and that's why I think he's asking those questions, and that's why I'm going to follow up on some of those questions in just a second. I have concerns that even when we authorize programs, they may obscure the risk, financial and risk, to actual lives that Americans face from natural disasters. This hearing is also incredibly timely. As we approach the one-year anniversary of Hur Hurricane Ian's landfall, FEMA's most recent report on the disaster relief fund suggests that it will be depleted near the end of the fiscal year. The National Flood Insurance Program will expire on September 30th, and reports indicate that the Biden administration will be requ requesting as much as $12 billion in disaster funding at some point this very day. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to hear from uh, the members of the community who are impacted by Ian and from the agencies responsible. So. First, for each of you, can you discuss what funding your respective agencies may be seeking in this disaster supplemental and how that funding will be put to use? We'll start with Ms. McFadden. I'm not aware of any funding for HUD. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Sanchez? Uh, I'm not aware of funding needs, sir. Thank you. Mr. McCool? Yes, sir. I understand that a supplemental re request will be moving forward imminently. Are you, I, I know that. That's what I just said. Uh, how much money are you asking for? Is FEMA asking for any money in this disaster supplemental? Oh uh, yes, sir. I have to get the specifics for you for the record. Okay. I would really, uh, since it's being requested today, I would assume that you could probably get that in the next 15, 20 minutes. Uh, you've got good staff there. I think they can make a call to HQ and find out for us. And I, I would like it before we leave the hearing to know how much, please. Yes, sir. So I want to get back to, to the thematically um, important topic that, that my colleague, Mr. Don, uh, Donalds, has brought forward. And, and I, I, I want to – he's such a diplomat, and I, he does it very nicely. And I, I don't want – I'm not trying to be antagonistic. I'm just trying to understand. Um, there's got to be – because you kept saying – you, you had some regulatory constraints that took 45 days there. What are those regulatory constraints? Can you, cite, can you cite some specific code or rules or regulations and give us some numbers so that we can understand uh, what those constraints are? So most, most of it's in 44 CFR, Part 60.3, uh, Part 9. Uh, they have to do with an environmental, floodplain management, et cetera. And, and so as we work through those issues, down to each community. Each community has a building official and a floodplain administrator, and they may have different standards of where we can put manufactured housing units. Uh, so, and then there's environmental standards, and then there's uh, working in the special flood hazard areas, and we don't put travel trailers in, in high hazard areas, V zones, et cetera. Uh, so so that, those are the, but once we find out there's no practical solution, uh, and can justify that, and in, in conjunction, we're doing a, a pretty detailed risk analysis on each and individual uh, and, unit going in. And, and so, so that's the regulatory constraint, and then then you have staffing constraints because because you have to you're, you're evaluating each each unit basically is what you're telling me. Each each survivor is different, and each has different needs. 
uh, based on family composition, based on mobility issues, ADA compliance, each and every situation is different. And what we like to do is put units close to the home, close to where the schools are, close to where the doctors are. You know, we could, we could easily put up group sites 100 miles away and people wouldn't come. So we have to talk to the survivors. We have to figure out what their needs are. Our number one focus is taking care of our survivors and what their needs are. Ms. McFadden, let's, let's, I'm going to leave that to come back to Mr. Mr. Donalds at some point. I don't even have any time to yield to you, Mr. Donalds. I, if I did, I would, I'd be yielding some time to you, but I'm, I'm over. But uh, the, the chairman is, is really relaxed on the rules today, which is I'm, I'm grateful for. So Ms. McFadden, in your written testimony, you mentioned that it takes around 18 months from the time of a disaster until the first CDBGDR dollar is spent. This is, of course, assuming that Congress even appropriates funding. And this, this is a, a critical issue. This is one of the issues that I, I want people to understand. There are 1,200 unauthorized programs, departments, and agencies in the federal government today, accounting for over $500 billion of spending, even though those programs are not authorized, including what we're talking about today. And in September, if we don't do anything more, that'll, that'll increase to over 1,500 and approach a trillion dollars in spending that's come, going to unauthorized programs. What problems incur because Congress has failed to act to uh, reauthorize the program, Ms. McFadden? Uh, thank you for the question. The first problem is when the worst disasters happen, my counterparts at other agencies immediately start moving funding, start working with survivors. We wait and hope, for the most part, that funding will be made available. Uh, because we do not have a permanently authorized program, we have been advised by our lawyers that we can't write regulations. So it's unclear to communities if they get the funds what the rules will be. And so they have to... Can I just interrupt you on that point just for a sec? Because there is no authorization. You can't write the rules, and so every disaster has a different set of rules. We have to publish Provided you get the money and authorization. Exactly right, sir. We have to publish the rules as a federal register notice. Uh, so we have heard from communities um, in jurisdictions that have had multiple years of funding how frustrating it is to have to track back to old federal, federal register notices to try to understand the rules as they're administering multiple grants, which may change over time. The benefit to that going back many years was that we could take lessons learned and apply them. Uh, but now that we have been in this business of doing disaster recovery for many, many years, every year or every other year, uh, we know that we are ready for a permanently authorized program and a real rulemaking process so to, to remove that uncertainty. Thank you. And I'm way over time, but I'll just tell you that gets back to my, my part of this theme is that uh, Congress as as much to share blame as, as any agency does in Congress, better step up and get itself together, not just in this area, but in those 1,500 programs, departments, and agencies. We need to determine if we're going to authorize them or not and get the work done on that. I yield back. Thanks.